We made this. Welcome back everyone to a podcast all about the sounds of cinema and discussion about them between the notes, which is where we come in. I'm Tony Black. And I'm Sean Wilson. And this week we're bringing you discussion of music from John Barry, Ennio Morricone, David Arnold and more as we discuss the epic cinema of American independence and history scores to tie in with the July the 4th weekend this year and all the celebrations that are going on. Uh, Because who better to talk about, you know, American history and uh, revolution against the pesky Brits than two white British men in their 30s, Sean? (laughs) Exactly. Because we we were there at the the, the very onset of all this. (laughs) Yeah, we we are over 250 years old and and doing well for it. (laughs) (laughs) Because originally we talked about doing... um, a whole podcast about like scores for films that are about American independence. And we started to- looking at that and thinking, well, there are a few really good ones and we have included quite a few of them in this, but then we thought, well, we can expand this slightly. So let's talk a little bit more about sort of American history epics in Hollywood and a lot of the scores that come out of those. And I think we've put together 10 pretty, pretty good pieces of work from a variety of different, composers that cover not just American independence and you know the war of independence or anything like that but various other different either conflicts or aspects of American history from around that era and maybe going into the old west and things like that because I I think broadening it out gives us a bit more of a range Sean doesn't it really to talk about scores that I suppose have things in common but also go in different kinds of directions. I think what we've done is we've alighted on scores that talk about the American character. And to go back to your point earlier, we are two British blokes, so there's only there's only so much we can buy <laughs> into that as, as a premise. But obviously, as Brits, we have been regularly exposed to American cinema and particularly American epic Western cinema. It's one of my um, favourite areas of, of filmmaking, actually. I, I've always found... Um, the American landscape, the kind of physical and socio-political landscape of America, very, very interesting. And the whole, the foundation of America and the the movement of the frontier, the, the Old West, uh, Buffalo Bill, Calamity Jane, I, I find that very, very fascinating. But also going back to know where all that started and how cinema and television and music have captured that. And also the, in, the interesting thing being that how... Uh, creatives from 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 non-American cultures have, have have captured that as well because some of the composers that we're showcasing aren't uh, who who've written scores in this area aren't actually American. So what does that mean for you know a, an outsider's perspective looking in on the idea of you know, the notions of of American patriotism? This would be something that will be interesting to get into. But I um I went on a road trip around America back in 2008. I did um Trek America. I think that kind of cemented in my mind just the, the the vastness of the American landscape and the variety of it as well. So yeah, I was looking forward to recording this one today. It should be fun. Yeah, it will be. What's Trek America then? Because based- I've, I've not I've not come across that before. It's this. It's the sister company to Camp America because a neighbour of mine um, back in Devon, where I'm from, did Camp America, and I wasn't necessarily interested in doing that. And he said, "Well, have you heard about Trek America?" And I hadn't. And basically, you can go on organised tours over the course of several days or weeks, uh, all across America, either throughout America or to different sections of America. I did um, north to south, so New York to Los Angeles, and then south to north, back Los Angeles, back to New York. It was brilliant. <laughs> a group of people in a, in a camp van. We didn't know each other. Uh, this was after I finished university basically exploring the american landscape i saw some astonishing places i saw did a helicopter trip over over um the grand canyon amazing saw monument valley immortalized in the films of john ford the monument valley is one of the most beautiful places i've ever seen 
just astonishing and the movie connection made it all the more precious for me as well went to new orleans went to los angeles went to new york yeah amazing so um i would appear to be probably the right person to, <laughs> to have on, on this episode. <laughs> well hopefully outside of an american yeah definitely that's cool i, I mean i i uh, i remember camp america was always a thing in the 90s when when i was growing up you know there was it was a, it was something that was always a bit too expensive for my family because i was quite a working class family from the midlands and camp america was just a little bit too and and i think at that time i was a little, i would have been a bit scared at the idea of going off to america but when I look back now, I mean, I, I did a road trip as well around a couple of years after you, uh, around 10 years ago. I think it was 10 years ago, exactly, actually. And I went with a couple of mates uh, and we met up with a guy who we knew over there uh, who lived in Oklahoma. So we flew to Texas and then we drove in his ca- in his truck um, all from Texas, uh, right down Corpus Christi, which is on the Gulf of Mexico, which is really nice, all the way up through. We went to Roswell. To have a look at all the alien I, stuff. I, I, I went to Roswell. Yeah, you went there as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there's 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 nothing there. Like... There was nothing <laughs> apart apart from the street lamps with the alien bulbs on them uh, and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and the McDonald's that's shaped like a UFO. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is there is absolutely there is a Roswell museum, which is fine, uh, which is quite quite good quite good and comprehensive, but it's not particularly like you know <laughs> special. <laughs> and and there was. There was a junk shop, and I'm, I will have talked about this somewhere else on podcasts at some point. There was a junk shop, on, the, and it's, it's just one street, one street with stores, and that's it. And there's a junk shop on one of them that had the biggest giant Jar Jar Binks I've ever seen <laughs> in wax. Freaked me out, seriously. I was like, what the heck? Right next to some Nazi memorabilia as well. So it was a very strange shop. Oh, that. my God. Um, yeah, really weird. But, um, yeah, we went up through Roswell, which doesn't, yeah, isn't as exciting as, like, cinema has led, led us to believe and then uh into we we like through new mexico and and to the grand canyon and i didn't do the helicopter ride but i went to the grand canyon and uh through to vegas and then la and then we sort of came back on ourselves i think you're talking about the majesty though of it new mexico really blew me away in that sense because you know there was one at one point where we got to that we got to a crossroads and the and the sat nav went turn left for 1000 miles and i went, oh what? my god yeah yeah 1000 mi- not kilometers miles and that's like the longer than the span of of britain like and i was like jesus and so you're just driving through these open roads with you know the pueblos and all these beautiful cliffs and and native american reservations and it's it's you know it takes your breath away and then i i loved like being in gallup new mexico staying in gallup and you just heard that particularly american thing of the train and the train horn as the train rolls by that distant yeah. kind of bar, bar, kind of thing you just don't get that in in england in the same way i just the majesty of the place bl- really really knocked my socks off in a way that i don't think any other country i've visited ever has it's the colour of the landscapes as well. I mean, in New Mexico, we went to Zion National Park, and the way that the light, that the colour, the, the, the colour of the rocks and, and the sandstone goes from this kind of ochre and orange to like blue and purple as the temperature comes down. Now, that's one of the things that I really remember in Monument Valley as well. But yeah, we we stayed on a Native American reservation in um, in Monument Valley, and I remember being taken into one of the traditional um, mud huts, the hogans, I think they're called. And there was an old lady, um, Native American lady, who was uh, weaving. Uh, and I was, well, we were told, the group was told that uh, as a little girl, she had appeared in John Ford's very first movie, The Iron Horse, wow. back in the Silent wow. Night. So I was like, wow, I'm looking at a piece of film history here. And she was still so dexterous with her fingers, like braiding and, and weaving. And one of the girls on the, on the trip had her hair braided by this lady. And um, yeah, just the things like that are just really really extraordinary and obviously catnip to you know someone like me <laughs> i bet she's still going now i bet yeah bet she's still alive yeah it'd be, like it'd be about interesting. 100, 110 <laughs> I mean, yeah i mean she, she was very very old at the time she was in the late 90s i think i remember saying late 90s maybe bordering on 100 so if she is still alive it would be pretty extraordinary so bet she is i'm gonna pretend she is i'm gonna believe <laughs> she is definitely um so yeah it's it's an amazing place, you know. I mean, uh, it might be going through some troubled waters right now, politically, socially, but you know, if you can put that aside, it is a wonderful place to visit, really, because generally the people are absolutely lovely, and that the the majesty of the place, especially if you can do a road trip, which 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 is does make it a bit extra special, I think. Being able to just drive, and I wasn't 
actually driving at the time. I was a passenger, but just being able to experience it driving through towns and on the big open roads and and, and everything like that and the, and the vistas you see. I mean, I, I'll never forget coming down from the Grand Canyon, actually. Uh, and the, we went in like April. Well, for one thing, it stunned me how freezing the Grand Canyon was right at the very top. And there was snow. And I couldn't quite get my head around that because you always expect it to be this arid kind of place. Really hot. And it wasn't. And coming down from the canyon through Arizona, uh, through Ari- Arizona, Arizona, I think it is. Is Arizona, Arizona or Utah, maybe, or maybe one of the two. Yeah, I think it might be Arizona, but somewhere like that. We were heading towards Nevada anyway because we were going to Vegas, and I remember we driving down from the canyon, which is all rocky, and we drove through this incredible, like snowy, foresty vista with with essentially a fjord running through it. And I tell you what, we could have been in Norway, and and it was it was like half an hour's drive from the Grand Canyon. And I I, I was saying to my friends, I was like, how are we here? It's like we've been transported, and then you come out of that, and you're in the desert again. And I, so America is just fascinating. Like the, the landscape is incredible, and it can flip between different things in the blink of an eye. Sometimes, yeah, it really, it really can. I remember that when we when we were, when we were coming across the north, and we went from the plains of, of Dakota into the Badlands, where they filmed uh, Dances with Wolves, which is one of the films we're going to be uh, talking about. One of the scores we're going to be talking about, and the the landscape of the Badlands. It's like someone has just carved out the landscape with some kind of giant shovel and these weird like sort of rock formations and nodules it's what one might imagine being on the moon is like and it, it, once again when the light goes down it goes from these kind of like sort of creamy like reds and and sort of oranges and browns into this weird like violet color it's just really really quite amazing i'd never seen anything that and that landscape literally snuck up on us i was like wow i was like how did we go from these rolling like grassy plains to all of a sudden this weird carved out landscape <laughs> you know no wonder that kevin costner was so besotted with it in dances with wolves it's amazing. <laughs> good understanding can't you yeah but yeah, it's it's an incredible place. Lest this turn into Tony and Sean's travel podcast, however, I think we should. <laughs> There's a spin-off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, between the holidays, we'll call it. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, let's let's get in and, and talk about some of these some of these scores. As always, we will endeavour to put together a Spotify playlist. There will be some that aren't on Spotify here, but the majority are. Um, those that aren't, we'll try and dig out some of them on YouTube and put together uh, some as we did last week with the Adventure Scores show. So we can give you a bit of a taster of the kind of music to listen to, ideally alongside the podcast if you can, but if not, around it. Uh, and yeah, as as always, just if you can check us out, give us a subscribe if you haven't, check us out on iTunes, give us a little review. Uh, if you're enjoying the show, that'd be wonderful. Um, five stars, please. No less, five stars. <laughs> So, yeah, we've picked five scores each that represent American independence and history, historically, really. I think all of these all of these choices are historical, going back to 250 years. There's nothing really particularly contemporary here. It is all pretty, pretty much of, um, you know, earlier American history. So why don't we start with Revolution, which is your first choice, Sean. This is... From 1985, a historical drama directed by Hugh Hudson, um, starring uh, Al Pacino, uh, amongst <laughs> other people, <laughs> um, who's uh, he's a New York fur trapper who involuntarily gets enrolled in the Revolutionary Forces during the American Revolutionary Ro- uh, War. And the score here is by John Corigliano, uh, a uh, American composer of classical music generally. Now, uh, you chose this, Sean. I... I haven't seen the movie. I'm familiar with the film and I've always been quite curious about this one because it's not necessarily one that leaps out to a lot of people from Pacino's, you know, filmography. I'd never heard of John Corigliano before though. So what's your take on this? Why why was this one of the first ones you chose? Well, I chose this because when when back back in the early iteration of this particular episode, we wanted to we were thinking of focusing specifically on the American Revolutionary War, and then it was kind of like, well, that's actually quite difficult because there are actually that many movies or scores for those movies that I could find. This is one of the ones that that stayed over from that idea. Yeah, this this I I, I should confess I haven't seen this film. I can't find it online anywhere, and there's a good reason for that because it's got a notorious reputation for being one of the worst movies ever made, and. 
so bad that it scared Al Pacino away from making movies for four years and bankrupted its production company, Goldcrest. There are reviews online I've been watching about this. It's fascinating. The story about the making of the movie is probably more interesting than the movie itself. So, yeah, as you quite rightly said, American Revolutionary War epic, Al Pacino is the, the fur trapper. The, the, bizarrely, I was looking into the history of this film, bizarrely filmed in, in a mixture of Kings Lynn and Dartmoor, which is ra- <laughs> very, very okay. weird. I don't know. And they're why on that- opposite sides of the country <laughs> as well. <laughs> exactly. Not only that, they're also not in America. It's kind of like, okay, yeah, why, well, yeah. why, why, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're doing a movie about the, the events that led up to the foundation of America. Let's not shoot it in America. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very very peculiar again there are many many bizarre things about the making of this film the other one being al pacino apparently had pneumonia all the way through the making of it and oh my God. apparently you can see that on his face i mean there are clips online in which you've got al pacino going, oh so we're in the american revolutionary war i don't know what's going on <laughs> like, it's literally literally like that and he he's got he's got the, the mullet from scarface he's literally got the same hair from scarface with, with, with a slightly longer fringe he's like so what what is it good for oh it's just like, <laughs> literally like that and you think okay right this is this is very very peculiar and the film is one of the worst, the sort of biggest box office disasters ever. Amazingly, um, from the director, as you said, of Chariots of Fire, Hugh Hudson, you know, what a fall from grace that is to go from Chariots of Fire to this. But on on the nature of the of the music, yeah, John Crigliano, who um, is the classical composer, as you said, made his uh, film score debut with Altered States, the Ken Russell, Ken Russell film, which had an extraordinary avant-garde scored to it um that's a very very famous film about sensory deprivation and it made sense for the music to strike all kinds of weird atonal textures and actually the score for revolution when listened to on its own terms is very good it got nominated for a razzie presumably because it works awfully in the film presumably the film is just so ludicrously overblown from the clips i can see of it and the score appears to make the film worse than what it, what it otherwise would be <laughs> But on its own terms, it, as one would expect from a composer of Carignano's status, um, it's it's really really good. It, it, it what it does is it mixes those kind of very brooding avant garde textures about horrors of war with some beautifully lyrical passages, which presumably aim to capture the, the the innocence of the humanity caught in the conflict. Again, I haven't seen the film; I've only seen clips of it. And incidentally. And one of the other things I wanted to raise was the presence of, I didn't even know he was in the film, Donald Sutherland as the Yorkshire English officer against whom Al <laughs> you heard that right, <laughs> yeah, literally, um, against whom Al Pacino is pitted. Um, and he sort of goes through the movie talking a bit like that, you know, and uh, Al Pacino was like, what? What is this accent? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like, because <laughs> yeah, surely Donald Sutherland, because. You know, Donald Sutherland normally has that kind of lispy thing going on, doesn't he? That yeah. Donald Sutherland lisp thing. That's where he's a little bit sinister. Yeah, yeah. And so how's he going to translate that into Northern? Like, uh, honestly, oh, I, I'm going to be a Northern Donald Sutherland here. It's like, <laughs> it's like, like I, don't, I don't know. I don't really know what accent I'm supposed to be doing here. It's like, and, and you've got like, okay, so this, this film is obviously a complete and utter mess. And like, no wonder it's got such a bad reputation. And sort of standing out like a sore thumb is, is the score, which I actually think is really, really good. It's really... Yeah, I like the score. It's very, it's mm. really nice, isn't it? The, the, the lyrical bits are really lovely. The, 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 the militaristic bits obviously capture the brutality of, of war. I think the score clearly transcends the reputation of the movie. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, um, I, I, I went for a, we, we've had a little bit of a heat wave in the UK in the last few days as we record. I think it's breaking now. But I went for a walk uh, a couple of days ago at about 9pm and it was just balmy weather. It was wonderful. And I had this on while I was walking and I it just, I thoroughly, thoroughly became a bit entranced by it. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was very, very classical in, in the sense that it had some real sort of arias to it. It had like choral voices and it had some real, really lovely strings. And, and, and I felt like it worked on its own terms, actually, just as a lovely piece of classical music, as opposed to, you know, not really knowing the context for it. I can't believe you would. I mean, even if you think the movie's rubbish, I can't understand why you'd give this a Razzie. 
Like it's it's you know, or, or nominate this for a Razzie. That's really strange. It, it is peculiar. I can only assume it's because as we as we've said repeatedly, film music isn't autonomous. You know, the, the fate of a particular film score is tethered to that of the film. And if 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 the, if the ship goes down, unfortunately, the score will go down with it. And I think that, that this particular score actually sort of sets the standard for all the other scores we're going to be talking about, particularly in the um, the fife and drum arrangements, which are the sort of standard for, for scores about the um, American Revolutionary War and also the Civil War as well. So you have these period authentic pieces, as you quite rightly said, you have the arias, you have the string elegies, you have the very, very dissonant areas, which I suppose called to mind. Uh, people like Stravinsky and Ligeti and 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 Bartok, I, I imagine these are influences that Crigliano drew drew on. Um, Crigliano himself is probably best known for his Oscar-winning score for the Red Violin, which was a 1999 film. He also wrote an, a, a rejected score for the Mel Gibson remake uh, Edge of Darkness. That score was replaced by one from Howard Shaw. So Crigliano has dabbled in film music before, um, and I think I think this score is really good. It, it deserves to be rediscovered amid the wreckage of yeah. the film. I agree. I agree. It's really nice. Go and, uh, go, it is on Spotify, so go and check. Even if the film's not available, the score is. So we'll put some we'll put some tracks in the playlist. I tell you, I'll, I'll, we'll finish this though with one last fact about Revolution in terms of the cast. <laughs> As because if we haven't you will, enough. <laughs> <laughs> you will never get a cast again that includes not just Pacino and Donald Sutherland, or even someone like Nastasha Kinski, who was you know pretty famous back then, but also Rocky Horror Show's Richard O'Brien. <laughs> Uh, Frank Frank Windsor, best known as the, as the guy who comes on television telling you to get like funeral arrangements sorted because you're basically going to die. Stephen Burkoff, yeah. he of the crazy, wild eyed, you know, brilliant villain performances in everything from Beverly Hills Cop, whatever, to, to you know, Octopussy, yeah. and then like you know, hardcore sort of Stra- Stra- uh, Stanislavski or whatever theatre. Joan Playwright, Mr. You know, Dame <laughs> Olivier, you know, Mid Lady Olivier. And just to cap it off, Sean, what is arguably my favourite, EastEnders' very own Ricky Butcher, Sid Owen. <laughs> <laughs> you will never get a cast like that again oh, in cinema. Amazing. So, so I'm in a revolutionary movie. I got I got Sid Owen. Hoo ah. What? What Al? So, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth was going on with this film? And how how did John Crigliano write such a beautiful score for it? What did what did he think when he when he viewed the, the initial edit of the movie? What must have been going through his head? Like what on I, earth I, is I, happening? <laughs> no idea. But that cast alone makes me want to find this film. So you know, I'm going to seek it out. Moving on, I did make a mistake earlier. We do have one contemporary score, actually, for a film set in a contemporary era, in the contemporary era, and that is the next one, which is David Arnold's score for Independence Day, the 1996, you know, science fiction epic that everybody, I'm pretty sure, has seen Independence Day and doesn't really need much talking about that. You know, aliens turn up in big ships, Will Smith, Jeff Goldblum and Bill Pullman team up (laughs) to take them out. Directed by Roland Emmerich. One of those films that I think you and I grew up with, Sean, basically, as the block, defining block, one of the defining blockbusters, if not the defining blockbuster, actually, of the 1990s, I would say, Independence Day. It was a film that sort of blew everyone's socks off, in, especially when you were a child. I was 14 when that came out. And, you know, no, we'd never seen anything like the, the White House being blown up like that in cinema before. You know, it was... If if it's not as great a film as something like Jurassic Park, I think Independence Day sits alongside that for just sheer sort of eye-widening spectacle of the 90s where you go, wow, this is what they're doing with special effects now. And I, and I, it's got it's got a belter of a score as well. It, it, it really does. I mean, it's impossible to overstate how big Independence Day was when it came out. I, I, I am sorry to make you feel old. I wasn't old enough to watch this in the cinema. I, 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 <laughs> what? I, 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 yeah, I know, right? <laughs> well, Al Pacino came out. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> I was only nine when this came out in the cinema, but I remember getting it immediately on VHS. And when VHS was the big thing, and it had the holographic cover on the front of the VHS, where if you moved it, the the, the alien oh, laser, yeah. the, the laser beam 
beam came out and then it blew the white That's house cool. and then you moved it and then the laser beam disappeared. Yeah. Um, I, remember, I had that. <laughs> you had that as well. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, I did. It? Yeah, but, I yeah, mean, it was get, good. Getting that in um, in Woolies, God, we really are going down nostalgia. <laughs> oh wow, <Blimey. laughs> that is old. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it, with your pick and mix, did you get? Did you get with your pick and mix? Got, in, Woolies got, as well. got some pick and mix as well. Yeah, down at the, um, <laughs> at, the at the Woolies in Torquay. Yeah, yeah, and um, I just remember really treasuring that film on on VHS. You're absolutely right. No one had seen anything like that before, and the fusion of the old school disaster movie, which kind of had kind of fallen out of fashion in the mid nineties. You know, that happened all the time in the seventies. Think like earthquake and the towering inferno and the Poseidon adventure that came back in the nineties when independence day fused with an extraterrestrial invasion movie. And it put the Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin, his production partner, put those two things together and it was spectacular. And it doesn't take itself seriously, which I think is entirely to the, to its credit in spite of the massive destruction that happens it's a movie that's got a, that's got a good heart to it and it's got a, it's got a winking sense of humor and there's a brilliant thing that dean devlin said about david arnold who wrote the score it's like trust a brit to write a score that sounds more patriotically american than what an american could come up with or words to that <laughs> and he's at dean devlin is absolutely right david arnold's score is one of the most spectacular of the decade p- precisely because of how you know un how unrestrained it is and how roaringly rousing it is but that that's not to suggest that the score is all bluster and noise it isn't it's a really really well put together score and i think it, it's it's tethered exactly to to the tone of the movie which is it is it's cheeky and it's knowing and yet it also has to be sincere enough to get the audience on board because if you don't have that emotional investment you won't buy into the still terrifying scenes of the White House being blown up or New York being laid waste. So you need that engagement. And I think the, the score does a brilliant job of, you know, playing up that ridiculous sense of, of patriotism, but also making you feel for the characters. So you have the um the standard the standard symphonic approach of the trumpets and the and the trombones and, and the French horns to create that sense of of patriotic vigor but you also have the more intimate scenes like for example the scene w- which caused everyone to cry when the first lady mary mcdonald dies which the strings kind of bring you down to earth in the midst of all the big spectacular symphonic set pieces you need those moments just to balance it out a bit and then just the, the finale the, the choral crescendo in the finale i think is some of the best use of, of vocals i've ever heard in a film score yeah i can't say enough good things about this film it's one and and the score it's wonderful it's so good it's it's really great like there are some really he, he manages to capture so many things he he captures the the awe of the alien ships arriving you know in in some of the earlier tracks where it, it's crossing across the moon you know, and you see the shadow of the ship on the moon. He's got that. He's got lots of different themes for many of the characters, like Will Smith's Cap- um, Captain Hiller. You know, there's there's uh, and Jeff Goldblum's character, and and it, there's just there's just so much going on, and it's so it, like you say, he's very knowing, and it's very it's very exciting. You know, I'll never forget the the way he builds up to the first alien explosion of the uh, uh might be the empire state building or, or one of the, the big skyscrapers in new york and it sort of builds up and at that point then for all of the destruction it sort of cuts off for like five or ten minutes and you're just having explosions explosions but he builds it up to such a crescendo that your heart is in your it helps that scene become a heart in your mouth scene whenever you watch it it's a bit like <gasps> what is going to happen and then <laughs> it's, just, it's just it's it's brilliant the way he does that and it it was arnold on a real really good patch wasn't it because he'd done stargate just before this for the same producer director team and that's a great score as well and the, and he's doing great work with bond around this point as well he's got tomorrow never dies just around the corner and then the world is not enough and you know they're they're, they're both really good in their own different ways particularly tomorrow never dies i think but like he was on a real sweet spot here and it's it's arnold on all firing on all cylinders well, I think what you've highlighted there about the build up to the to the Empire State Building being blown up is how well spotted the film is as well, because it's not just the quality of the music. It's how the directors and the sound editors and the editors uh, sit down with the composer to, to identify right what what points in the film need music, what points in the film don't need music. And what you get is, yeah, that that build up as as they're all attempting to evacuate. You've got the multi stranded narrative showing various characters attempting to get away before the onset of the initial attack, and the way that the, the music builds to the to Jeff Goldblum's laptop counting down to like zero, 
And it's it's really, I mean, as a nine year old, that's genuinely quite chilling, and it's really well done. And yeah, you're right. the The fact you don't need music during the attack sequence, the horror of the sequence speaks for itself with the sound effects, which are also fantastic. But then after the five minute sequence showing the White House being blown up and Air Force One taking off and New York being laid waste to and Washington as well, the music comes back in for the tunnel sequence with um, it's Viv- Vivica A. Fox, isn't it, playing Will Smith's wife. Um, you've got the, the music comes back in for that sequence of, you know, you go from the, the, the scene of the city being laid waste to all of a sudden it being a more personal story about a character to whom you've been introduced. And that's what the music creates, that sense of identification with individual characters. And that that's what works so magnificently in, in the score. It's, it's big and small at the same time. I think it's interesting we're going to talk about another Roland Emmerich score on this podcast for which David Arnold didn't do the score he was he was roped in to do it and then it didn't work out and he hasn't worked with Roland Emmerich since and I don't know why that is I I didn't ask him about that we people can go back and listen to our episode with the interview with David Arnold I didn't ask him that because I didn't know if it was going to be a sore subject but it's a real shame because the Independence Day score is just stupendous. It's one of the best of the mm. decade. It is one. It is one of the best of the decade. I completely agree with you there. I think that's the best way to sum it up. And uh, even though it's not necessarily in step with some of our historical epics, it was one of those films that was expressly sort of tapping into that American patriotism. It was released on July the fourth in nineteen ninety six. You know, the sort of tagline was ID four. You know, it's called Independence Day. It's very much in the same sort of vein as that kind of. You know, it's that kind of thing. And you've also got the, the, the pivotal scene where Bill Pullman does the president's speech, which is now held up as one of the most cringy speeches of all time. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it, it's cringy in a very knowing kind of way. It's not, it's, it, the film doesn't take itself seriously. And I think David Arnold's humour, David Arnold is very funny. Anyone who can go back and listen to our interview with him, he's very funny and very dry. And I think David Arnold knew how ridiculous that scene was. And he makes the scene more ridiculous intentionally so through the use of the trumpets and the french horns and it's kind of like you know america has fallen on its knees at this point in the film it's now going to be reborn again <laughs> it's just yeah and the music gets yeah. that brilliantly it does it does and you know it, even cheesy as it may be it's a great movie moment the pullman speech really so you know it's worth it for that alone but yeah so uh let's move on then let's go back in time to the last of the mohicans which is our next one which is the 1992 Michael Mann epic set in 1757 during the French and Indian War. So this is just a little bit before independence. This is might be the furthest back we go, actually, on this podcast in terms of uh, distance. I might be wrong there, but I think it is. Um, in terms of sort of uh, tapping into sort of... I, I suppose this is... I suppose this this, this 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 is American history in its own sense, even if it's maybe a little bit more about colonial America, I guess you know. And and it's 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 a slightly different shade of history, but it's uh, a score by well, a combination of Trevor Jones and Randy Edelman, and it's it's a a, a beautiful score, and for a film that is one of uh, Daniel Day Lewis's most signature roles, and I haven't seen this film for donkey's years to the point that i can't remember a lot about it i think i saw it when i was quite young but it's it's a it's a classic this it's everyone most people i think have seen the last of the mohicans yeah it's 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 a it's a it's a belter of film um, adapted um from james fenimore cooper's 1826 um novel uh so yeah it's it's a really really interesting movie because what you have as you said you have the yeah like the the pre sort of pre-birth of America in a way, the events that would lead to, you know, America becoming what it is in, in the modern age. And through the eyes of the Hawkeye character, who is, you know, the the adopted son of the uh, Mohican um, tribe leader. And through through his eyes, we are witness to, you know, the closing of a chapter in a, a period in American history, just as another one prepares to open up. This is probably best um, signified by the final shot of the movie, in which you have the, the, th- the three characters looking out on the promontory over the landscape. Okay, look, there's a there's a kind of there's a sadness to it, and yet there is also a kind of majesty in that the, the country was about to advance into a new age. And the idea that Daniel Day Lewis is kind of white, but he's been adopted by the Native American Mohican tribe. He is of two sides essentially, and he, he, it's through his eyes that we see the action um, unfold with its various internecine conflicts. Yeah, really, really beautifully directed by by Michael Mann. They're making a rare excursion into historical um, 
drama. You know, very Michael Mann is often known for quite contemporary uh, thriller crime uh, movies. Think of Thief, think of Heat, obviously Miami Vice as well. Um, the, the, looking into the creation of the score, this is interesting. We brought we brought up the the problems of uh, dual composers when we talked about the Never Ending Story the other week with the Klaus Doldinger and uh, Giorgio Moroder. And I was kind of interested to know um, why it was that, that Trevor Jones and Randy Edelman had sort of worked on this together. And I, I, I looked into it. The idea was that Trevor Jones was brought on board originally. Trevor Jones, fabulous composer, really, really great composer. Prior to this, probably best known for scores like The Dark Crystal, which was one of my favourite films when I was younger. That, that was, you know, the Jim Henson movie. And the main theme from that is one of those brilliant melodies that I, I can hear it in my head now. It gets under your skin and it stays there. Trevor Jones really really good melodist not used enough anywhere near enough in movies nowadays as far as i'm concerned he also did scores like cliffhanger and um dark city and you remember the tv version of merlin with sam neill do you remember that no no i don't know actually he, no. he also did that? The, about 97 98 i think i'll have right, to look it okay. up but he did the score for that and trevor jane's fab, fabulous composer um, we've got a real, real ear for um, good, sweeping Hollywood melody. But apparently what Michael Mann originally wanted was a, was a kind of electronic score. And gradually throughout the post-production process of the movie, which is apparently quite messy and quite hectic, the, the brief for the score changed from this largely electronic sound, which is unsurprising if you've seen Michael Mann's other movies. He kind of favours that, that, that sort of tone. And then they gradually realise that what you need is a more organic orchestral score to represent the, the majesty of the landscape and the majesty of the characters. And um, as a result, Trevor Jones was forced to rework a lot of his uh, material, but he actually ran out of time to be able to re- to be able to score all of the scenes. And that's when Randy Edelman came in. And Randy Edelman came in and uh, scored several other um, several other cues, and for that reason, the score wasn't nominated for an Oscar because the idea of it shared between two composers, so it wasn't nominated for an Oscar. Although it's it's reportedly one of the best selling film soundtracks of all time, I think largely because of that main theme, that the top of the world theme, which is really really famous. It's one of the great majestic film themes of the nineties. You know, it really does speak of colonial era america of, of you know the, the fact that everywhere everywhere is forested you know there is savagery there is fighting between the various native american tribes between you know the, you know the, the, the french and the english and it's it's very it gets the beauty of the landscape really really well the other the other interesting thing so to further add to the complications in the in the creation of the score there is the the scene towards the end where um so that there is the the rescue of of the um of the Jody May character from the rival Native American tribe, which is scored to a piece called uh, the Jail by um apparently by Dougie McLean, as a Scottish singer songwriter. I didn't know this until looking into it. I assume that that was a melody that Trevor Jones had come up with. Apparently, Trevor Jones adapted this tune, uh, the Jail. And then interwove it around his own his own main theme as well, oh, okay. which is intriguing. And then on top of that, there's the clan ad score. I will find you because there's that famous line that Daniel Day Lewis says to Madeline Stoller, "I will find you." The, the waterfall scene. Um, so it's quite a messy soundtrack situation. But I have to say, listening to it on its own, I think that the the Edelman and the Jones sections do largely come together. I think Edelman's sections are probably more introspective and maybe harder. To, to it, it, it takes longer for them to stick in the memory. Jones, Jones's contributions are just really fabulous. W- what do you think of it? Yeah, I mean, without it's because it's been so long since I saw the film, I don't quite have the same level of context and knowledge there. But I, I, I was swept along with it. I thought it was lovely. I thought it was, I thought it was really, it really did get that epic feeling of of conflict and also romance. I, I, I really did feel that. I mean, I, I really like Trevor Jones. I mean, I really like what. Well, Trevor Jones did a few years, uh, about 10 years later on The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which is a film that's panned, but I love the score to that. I think it's brilliant. So he's he's a great he's a great composer. And I think, yeah, I, I loved it. I thought I was swept along. It really made me want to go back and watch the movie because it's been, it's been ages. But yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was lovely. Absolutely lovely. As was my next choice, which surprised me actually, because this is a film I've seen a while ago and a film I didn't love. But I loved the score when I listened to it in isolation, which is uh, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis' score to The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, the Andrew Dominic film 
from ooh, around 10, 11 years ago, which is set in 1881 in the Old West and sees uh, Robert Ford seeking out Jesse James and the James gang as they're planning a train robbery. And it's, it's you know, it's a long film, 160 minutes. And, and, I, I, and I, you know, I'm a big fan of Brad Pitt. I think he's great. And I've got nothing against the cast. Really great cast. You know, looked brilliant. So many people loved this film. I need to try again because it, it's, it's, it just didn't click with me the first time around. I'm not the biggest fan of Westerns anyway. I like them, but I, it's not my go-to genre. And I, it's one I definitely need to have another run at because I just couldn't get into it. I mean, t- to be fair, Sean, I didn't like Fight Club the first time I saw it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and now... And now I think it's a masterpiece. So you know, I'm fully, I'm fully willing to admit that I will get, I will see films differently with time, and I will get it wrong sometimes. But the score, when I listened to it the the first time around in isolation, I thought this was wonderful. I mean, I, I love what Nick Cave and Warren Ellis do. Anyway, I mean, I, I thought their uh, score last year or the year before for Wind River was gorgeous, and they've done some brilliant stuff, you know, uh, uh, in in recent years, and. Um, I, I, this was no exception for me. Yeah, I think it's um, uh, to, to go to, to, to go back to the film first. I think it's a demanding watch, but it's an engrossing one. I have to be honest; it's been a while since I've seen it all the way through. But I remember being really entranced with it, with the Roger Deakins cinematography, uh, with the fact that it's almost it's a story of celebrity worship set in the nineteenth century. So it's got this weird kind of modernistic streak because the Robert Ford character admires the mythology of the Jesse James character, but the mythology doesn't match up with the man necessarily, which is very interesting. And um, Brad Pitt and Casey Affleck playing Robert Ford are brilliant. Really, really good performances. Really well. It doesn't need to be said that it's astonishingly well shot by Roger Deakins, possibly the greatest living cinematographer. And the score, yeah, because the film has this kind of modernistic streak, the idea it anticipates the rise of celebrity culture before that became a thing. And the score has got a kind of modernistic streak as well, which is unsurprising given that it's, as you said, from Nick Cave and Warren Ellis. So, you know, they've worked together on Nick Cave and, and The Bad Seeds. And prior to the, this film, they worked on the um, the proposition, the John Hillcoat um, Australian Western, which is a really good film. And that's got a really good score to it as well. Uh, yeah, I think this score, um, so just again, I, I looked it up because I, I was interested because this score has got a very, very kind of deliberately limited um, palette to it. It's got a kind of claustrophobic air of, of kind of melancholy which works very very well when aligned to the to the characters in the film because all of the characters in the film are kind of grappling with this sense of you know identity and loneliness and and melancholia and the score works very very well so apparently based on what's what it says on the cd liner notes cave played piano and celester and keyboards and warren ellis played viola violin guitar and keyboards so they performed they not only composed the score but also performed it as well so there is a real sense of obviously intimacy and joint collaboration on this and i think that definitely when you listen to the rhythms of it i mean certainly the tone of it could appear to be kind of ripped from you know old american legend you've got that wavering like fiddle arrangement violin arrangement which does very much speak of the lyricism of the american west but the rhythms have a kind of contemporaneous um sort of modernistic air to them which is again makes sense given given the area in which these guys normally operate they are modern day pop rock musicians and what you've got is the idea of modern day popular musicians absorbing the sounds of of, of, a, of a previous age so i think it's a very interesting score the way it exists within the period and also exists outside of it as well and it's just it's very very it's very arresting to listen to the idea of getting the um almost like the sense of the trudge through the landscape the fact that everything was a struggle uh the elements are working against you the landscape is working against you the idea is it's stripped the music deliberately strips all valor and heroism out of jesse james as per the movie yeah it's it's a very very it's a very very striking piece of work and i'm I'm completely with you about how it anticipates the score for wind river because i love that score as well that's a terrific film when wind river deserves more attention than it gets as does the score. But the, these these guys, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis, I think have really carved out a niche in terms of reworking the 
the Western soundtrack. I mean, there have been a lot of revisionist Westerns in recent years. I mean, the Western is one of those genres where people say, look, it, it's it's dead on its feet and it always comes back reimagined in some kind of form. I mean, in recent years, not only around the same time that Jesse James came out in this country, we had um, the likes of No Country for Old Men and also There Will Be Blood. Um, and obviously There Will Be Blood had a very, very angular, dissonant, creepy soundtrack from Johnny Greenwood. I love that. It's, it, isn't yeah. that, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's really good. Brilliant. It just shows yeah. that, that, that there isn't there isn't one way to film a Western and there isn't one way to score it either. There are many, many different ways in which you can get to the heart of what America is as a landscape. And I, I find that in particularly in the case of the assassination of Jesse James, I find that very, very interesting to listen to. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's it, it does convey that sense of landscape. And I think they're really good at that. They are really good at encapsulating the... Yeah, just the, the sort of haunting beauty of it. And that's why, yeah, you, you're right to bring up Johnny Greenwood's music for There Will Be Blood because there is sort of a similarity in some senses you know, in the kind of things they're trying to do. It's the sort of music you wouldn't think would make for great listening in a way, but it does. It does independently. And it's it's hard to... I mean, I found that with Wind River, which is far more sort of brooding and haunting. And, you know, I'd, I'd say it's, 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 there's, a le- there's less of a kind of old world magical sense to that than there is to this. There were points where I felt like there was a a kind of low key sort of majesty to this. And I, I just, I, it really just struck me. I was like, wow, this is, this is brilliant. Like I love, I love this. And again, I really want to go back and watch the film again. I've been meaning to rewatch this for so long, Sean, so long. Cause everyone is saying it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And I'm like, I don't get it. And I want <laughs> to get it. <laughs> like, so, you know, I will, I will get there. Um, because I hate not being part of the, it's great crew. You know, I'm not one of these people who will, dig my heels in and go, no, it's rubbish for the rest of my life. I'm like, please, I want to embrace it with you. (laughs) So, you know, I'll get there. I suppose there's one other thing to say as well, that Nick Cave himself plays a, um, a busker who is seen in a bar and he's, he, he, he's heard uh, performing a ballad, a real life ballad called the, the, the ballad of Jesse James, which apparently was written, written by Billy Gashade in 1882 and then covered by various other artists, including the likes of Woody Guthrie. So it's interesting the fact that there is that real att- Andrew Dominic obviously favored that real attention to detail in the music. It's obviously very well researched, not just in terms of the actual score, but the source music that appears within the film as well. It's incredible. I, I think, yeah, I, I would say go and watch it again because it's a movie that's so steeped in the violence and sadness and rage of, of the, in the dying of the American West. And I think that the score gets that magnificently. I will do, 100%. I'll definitely go and watch it. Your next choice, your third choice, Sean, is the uh, miniseries. We're going into TV territory for this, for the miniseries John Adams from 2008, which uh, starred Paul Giamatti as John Adams, the... US president who was involved in the founding of the United States. So this is just after the Revolutionary War. And uh, this was directed by Tom Hooper. And I think we should categorise Tom Hooper's career basically now as everything BC. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And that stands for? Before Cats. (laughs) Before Cats, exactly. (laughs) So this was... This was, uh, when did Cats come out? This was 11 BC for Tom Hooper, <laughs> it was 2008. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it did really well, this. It's all about the first 50 years of uh, his, of the United States, basically, through the through the lens of John Adams. So it's uh, a big HBO dra- drama. One I'd love to watch, actually, seven parts. It's just up my alley, this. So I need, to, I need to dig this out. With a score by Robert Lane and Josie Fitterelli. Not one I've, I was familiar with. I really liked it when I listened to it. It's, it's a long, like, an hour and 15 minutes, I think, on Spotify. It's plenty of music on there. It was great. And uh, what what about this one then? I mean, apart from the subject matter, Sean, but what about this one really captivated you? Yeah, I think that there's just that sense of lyricism. And again, me- I've used this word quite a lot, melancholy. Uh, the fact that the, obviously the birth of America was dotted with you know, as many tragedies as, as it was triumphs. I, ha- I have to confess, I haven't seen the series. I know the series has got, as you said, has got a very, very good reputation. Apparently it won four Golden Globes and 13 Emmys. Paul Giamatti plays John Adams. You've also got the likes of David Morse as, as, as George Washington, you know, Laura Linney as John Adams' wife, Abigail, fabulous cast. And I think what the score 
again, bearing in mind I haven't seen the actual series, what the score appears to be getting at is not only the stature of America's political figures at the time, but also the kind of interpersonal tragedies that were going on with them as people because they weren't just statesmen, they weren't just figheads, they were people. And clearly there were things going on in their lives. They, they, they were, there were mistakes going on. There were personal tragedies. There were deaths. Uh, there's, there's the track towards the end called Abigail Dies, which I think is probably the most beautiful on the whole album. It's incredibly kind of mournful and an evocative piece of music. But mixed in with that, to go back to the, um, the, the revolution score, the John Crigliano score, in the John Adams score, there were like the use of the fifes and the drums and the trumpets to get the... That that's the kind that's the advance towards America becoming the country that it was. That's all the violence that leads up to the idea of George Washington becoming the first president of, of the United States of America and then John Adams after that. So you've got that at the start of the score, and Rob Lane covers the majority of that material. And then and then John as far as I can make out, um they, they he and John um Joseph um it's Vitarelli kind of divided the score between them so they scored um an equal number of episodes as i can make out and i don't quite know why that is i can only assume because because rob lane is a very very well well regarded um british composer who's worked uh, extensively on television and i can only imagine that because this is a score about the foundation of america that maybe they kind of thought well it's not enough just to get a british composer in it we need an american on it as well to give it that kind of residual character that's me i'm completely speculating on that but yeah apparently the two composers didn't didn't collaborate and didn't interact they their, their their duties were quite evenly divided up uh one part of the score was recorded in the uk the other apparently was was recorded in los angeles but harmonically there isn't really much to distinguish the work between the two composers because it is consistently beautiful and very lush and i think it does a very good job of Sort of playing up the nobility of what was going on without being too queasily patriotic because i think from what I, i've watched a few clips of the series from what i can understand the series is actually interested in probing the the flaws and the personalities of the various people involved and i think it therefore makes sense that the the music doesn't spill over into that kind of queasy overly glamorized tone i think it's very very well judged and, and very carefully um, measured there is there is the track um, the, the declaration of independence which obviously that must be the pivotal moment in the series or one of the pivotal moments which has a, a, a grandeur to it but it's a very kind of controlled grandeur through the trumpet which i think is is beautiful and i think there are many pieces like that on the score yeah yeah i, th- I think you're right i think it's, it's interesting how it maybe reflects the the honesty of that period because it would be easy to make something that was just purely patriotic about the foundation of of, of America, but yeah, it's 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 interesting that the score wants to have those shades of grey as well. I thought I thought it was really good. I really did. Yeah, I thought that was a it was it was excellent. Definitely made me want to go and watch the series. I mean, um, it, it it is it is extraordinary that that Tom Hooper, a British person, could could treat the. Um, the founding of America with such gravity and such dignity. And obviously he then got um, critical acclaim and many awards for it. And then he would go on to make cats of all the <laughs> really <laughs> weird career I think, progression. Like, <laughs> I, th- I think it will be forever. Like I'd like to think we'll get to the point where Tom Hooper will do a very honest sort of commentary about cats and just go, I don't know either. <laughs> I, I don't know how I got here either. I'm really not sure, and I don't know what happened because I think <laughs> he's not. Don't get me wrong; he's not exactly like the greatest director of all time, but he's made good stuff. You know, he made The King's Speech, which is a great film. You know, he's made some really good. I mean, I know not everyone loves King's Speech, but I thought it's a really good film, and and he he's, he has made some good things. But this, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> who, it's, um, maybe, who knows? Maybe it's when he got into the kind of like pompous, overblown musical period with the likes of Les Mis and cats obviously the, the the prestige obviously went to his head and he obviously thought well i'm tom hooper if i'm gonna put cgi fur all over my actors nobody's gonna stop me and it's probably, <laughs> you know i'm the director of lame is no one's gonna rein me in it's like tom <laughs> you know someone ought to yeah, have yeah, reined yeah. you in and it's it's astonishing to think that the man who made that one of the worst films ever made made john adams like i can't yeah I it's weird can't work it out <laughs> No, I don't think you'll be on your own. I think everyone's going to be baffled by that for a long time. Uh, (laughs) But uh, let's go for my third choice. Let's go into another classic. So we're going to go to the work of John Barry for Dances with Wolves, which was a 1990 
epic western produced and directed by Kevin Costner, the first film he directed, and obviously go on to do a few other um, epics uh, along the way of varying quality. But I think a lot of people would probably think that Dances with Wolves is, is his best or one of his best. All about the character of uh, Union Army Lieutenant John J. Dunbar, who uh, travels to the American frontier to find a military post and uh, has dealings with a group of Lakota Native American tribesmen um, and women and, and, and gets involved in that culture and everything like that. A massive epic movie, like three hours long, box office monster of a hit, became a legendary film very quickly. And I think it's fair to say, Sean, that amongst John Barry's career of like masterpieces, this has got to be one of them, hasn't it? Yeah, it was it was probably the final masterpiece that he delivered in his in his career it's kind of it's kind of a summation of everything that made john barry's music so good and i think one must also credit kevin costner for allowing john barry to paint on this really 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 epic canvas because you know a great film score won't just rely on the composer it will be the communication between the composer and the director Uh, that that's really really important and one needs to point that out but yeah, I mean, by this point in his career, so it's important to, to note that John Barry um, had to bail out of scoring the second Timothy Dalton Bond film, *Licence to Kill*, because he had his esophageal uh, cancer, and the um, and he was he was saved from that. And apparently, he dedicated the Oscar for the *Dance with Wolves* score to the doctors that saved his life. And one can clearly hear through the Dance with Wolves score, this is the work of a very kind of rejuvenated man, but also the work of a man who clearly believes in the material, who wants to paint with all these extraordinary symphonic colours. And John Barry was one of the greatest composers for that. He was, you know, fabulous, not just for the Bond scores, but also Out of Africa, The Lion in Winter, The Last Valley, Born Free. It, this John Barry could could sweep you along like few other composers could do so he was he was tailor-made for this film um interestingly enough looking into it he wasn't the original choice of composer it was going to be basil polidoris oh wow okay but that that would have worked uh we were, yeah i think it would yeah because we were talking about conan the barbarian just recently mm. and that has got the, the the kind of tone that would suggest you know a, a great score for Dancing with Wolves from Polidoris, but no, apparently he's um, he, he didn't he didn't score it in the end. It went to John Barry, and John Barry went on to win the Oscar for it. And just the sheer canvas of themes in Dancing with Wolves is miraculous. I mean, in a way, kind of it, it, it's it's the ideal movie for a composer to score because it's a big, bold, romantic end of the frontier epic was studded with lots and lots of characters studded with lots and lots of memorable scenes it's a movie about landscapes it's also a movie about people within the landscapes as you said and essentially john dunbar played by kevin costner this would be cat this would be catnip to any composer but particularly for john barry because john barry always loved doing movies like this he famously said to um Sidney Pollock when he scored um, Out of Africa, which was another film for which John Barry won an Oscar. He said, Sidney, I don't need to score Africa because the landscape speaks for itself. What I need to score is the heartache of the people. And that was a brilliant understanding of what made Out of Africa work. And the result was one of John Barry's most lushly beautiful scores. And Dancing with Wolves is right up there. I mean, you have the central trumpet theme for John Dunbar himself, which is put through all manner of variations as he goes from being a soldier to basically being an adopted member of, of the Lakota. So that that identity kind of gains in resonance and melancholy as he he realizes as a white man he realizes what is going to happen to the native american tribes before they do and it's a very sad film it's it's very it's very mournful and i think there is beauty in the score there is also real heartbreak in it as well but there is also the love theme uh, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that john barry ever came up with that just the what John Barry was so good at was the incidental pieces of music that don't necessarily rely on the main themes. What he was really good at was coming tracks for individual scenes that don't necessarily turn up again. Like you think of the um, the journey to Fort Sedgwick theme, which is it's so so good with those surging strings. You think this is it's a travelling montage. And yet Barry comes up with a piece of music that could act as the equivalent of another film's main theme. That's how good he was. Yeah. It's really, yeah. really quite extraordinary how he was able to do that. But the the cumulative feeling is one of beauty and heroism, but also sadness at the end. The fact this is a movie about the closing of a chapter in American history. And I think Barry got that. 
he understood that that he he was so good at getting beneath the fabric of a movie he wasn't like jerry goldsmith he wasn't interested in scoring the visuals but it was the emotions underneath the visuals yeah it's i mean it's what one as we said with independence day and david arnold this is easily one of the best scores of the 90s as well yeah yeah i i think i agree i agree right at the top of the 90s the john dunbar theme is just spectacular like that that, that track in itself makes it's a great score overall but that it's just beautiful it is one of the most beautiful tracks i think ever and i i think it, it you know that you could put particularly that up against almost any other piece of film music from film history and it would it would stand out it's just astonishing it's it might be the most lyrically beautiful of of the list we've got today i think dances with wolves you know it it would it would stand out as maybe the the, the standout amongst standouts for me at least but it's you know we, it, there's rich pickings here really the next one you've gone for your number 4 is is a real mix of of classical and film music i guess in the madness of king george which uh, sees uh, george fenton reworking the music of handel for uh, the uh, Nicholas Heitner film all about uh, with Nigel Hawthorne memorably playing the uh, the alien King George uh, who's you know mad basically <laughs> basically in the uh, and the film obviously revolves around the Regency crisis of 1788 so this is ju- this is not long after the American um, Revolutionary War and although it's not directly about America there are absolutely a- aspects of you know American history that are factoring in because there are there are lots of agendas rippling through a British Parliament about abolishing the slave trade and establishing relations with the new American, you know, nation, you know, the new United States and all this kind of thing. So it's it's definitely within the same era. And it's I there's not a lot of this weirdly around. I couldn't find this on Spotify. It's not massively on YouTube. So there was only a few a few pieces from this that I was able to to actually listen to. But it's reworking some really famous classical pieces, isn't it? Yeah, I, I suppose just 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 to add to that, I suppose yeah, I'm aware that this this is it's it's a British film about a British subject, but I, the reason why I picked it, well, for a couple of reasons actually. Firstly, yeah, the the, the spectre of the American Revolutionary War is shown to have a you know a profound impact on the character of King George the Third, played brilliantly by Nigel Hawthorne, who reprised his um, his role from from the original Alan Bennett, Alan Bennett play, magisterial performance from Nigel Hawthorne. So that is one of the reasons. Although it, it, it's set in Britain and it's about Britain, it's the influence of what was going on in America is very very important on the central character. The other thing is that I chose it because we very very sadly lost Ian Holm recently. Um, yeah, Ian Holm, who plays Doctor Willis, who is the Lincolnshire. Um, uh, physician who is brought in to cure King George of his apparent madness, and the very the opinion rages to this day as to what actually King George had, uh, whether it was bipolar disorder or, or or something else. But Ian Holm, it just goes toe to toe with Nigel Hawthorne in probably some of the best acting I've ever seen in a film. And this, know that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to pick this film, but also because it because it's based on the original play by Alan Bennett, and Alan Bennett also wrote the screenplay. Uh, Alan Bennett's Talking Heads is now being revised. A revived rather for uh, the BBC, so I just wanted to sort of throw that in there as well. But yeah, but yeah, I I, I ran into the same problems trying to find the, the score as well. As you said, it's 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 a series of variations on on Handel by by George Fenton, who was um, a very very fine British composer who's written the scores for the likes of uh, Dangerous Liaisons. Uh, was originally going to write the score for Interview with the Vampire as well, apparently, and was then replaced with Elliot Goldenthal. So the, the most famous scene in this bit of music is online is the scene where you have almost the mock coronation of King George III, where he is apprehended by Willis's uh, right hand men, essentially, and he is forced you know, against his will into the chair where he's, you know, it's, there's that classic scene of the, I'm the King of England. Like, no, sir, you are the patients. And then you've got the use of (laughs) of Zardok, the priest, which I looked into this by handle. Apparently that was used during the coronation of King George the second, which makes its use in, in the madness of King George, obviously deliberately ironic and both amusing and also kind of horrifying at the same time. Because what you have is, is the the monarch of the country being forced and restrained in a chair against his will to basically be made normal again, normal in inverted commas. And the use of Zardok the priest, which is the the famous now has now become the famous football anthem the world over. 
it's it's really it's really exceptionally well done the the cutting of the music to the scene is is brilliant and that use of irony um that get that sense of triumphalism is very 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 ironic and very powerful and the idea that you would in order to restore normalcy to the british court you have to you know create this kind of hideous inversion of, of a coronation with this chair in, in which in which the, the king is strapped it's a really powerful film it's it's a very funny film it's there's that there's that fabulous line when nigel hawthorne first meets ian holm and he says, "Get away from me, you scabby bum sucker!" <laughs> he doesn't want it. <laughs> it's, I mean, obviously, it's written by Alan Bennett, so it need, need, need it not be said that the writing is absolutely fabulous, because of course you would expect that. Um, but it's just, it's I mean, obviously, and and Helen Mirren as the Queen as well. It's really well acted. But the yeah, the, the use of the the adaptation of Handel works very very well. It is a shame that that I c- I couldn't find more of it online. But I could find that that's that scene with with Zay Dot the priest, not Zay Dot the priest, Zay Dot the priest, I should say, is um is the is the pivotal one there. And I would urge anyone if they haven't seen the film or maybe ha- um, need to go and revisit the film to look at that sequence again because it's 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 brilliant, brilliant use of music to add further dimensions to what what is already you know a, a, a very sort of troubling yet funny sequence. I, I I can't help but think it's a shame that Alan Bennett didn't actually play king george in that film because you would have you would have had a really interesting kind of film oh I don't... i'm king george <laughs> oh you're about to you're about to restrain me in the chair aren't you <laughs> don't, don't, don't let me go anywhere near that one <laughs> mother, mother mother i think i've gone a bit mad I'd, I'd quite like to have some scones and just sit by and not do anything <laughs> oh you've gone back and more yeah, into or, or... donald sutherland from revolution i was gonna say yeah like <laughs> We're now playing Donald Sutherland, <laughs> playing Alan Bennett. <laughs> uh, anyway, before we fall down, an imp- I think we should just do a podcast about impressions. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think, I think yeah, this is where we're point, going. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Yeah. We, just, we, don't do, we, we, we do more impressions than we talk about the yeah, music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yeah, The Man of King George is, is fab. It, it's, it's really interesting. I want to go and um, revisit the film and check out more of that, the, the you know, source material for that music as well. Next up, then your uh, my, my fourth choice is well, kind of your choice as well because I know you've been jonesing to talk about this, but this is Glory from um, Edward Zwick uh, from 1989, starring uh, Matthew Broderick, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, amongst others, set in the American Civil War. So we're going forward now a good 80, 90 years to the mid 19th century, and. Uh, all around, all about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, which was the uh, the Union Army Second African American Regiment in the uh, Civil War. A well known movie, pretty like you know epic film within within the landscape of this, with a score from James Horner. Although the film didn't do very well, did it? The film didn't do well at the box office massively, um, and I, I I think it was I think it. I think it had mixed reviews at the time, but it's but regardless of the film's quality, and I, I don't think I've seen this film actually. The score is, I mean, it's it, for James Horner. I mean, it's James Horner, so it's already great. But this is particularly good, isn't it? It is, um, and the film is brilliant. You, you need, you really need to go and see the film. It's one of the best Civil War movies ever made. The, the, seriously, really, really good. Uh, yeah, and the the score works hand in hand with the with the visuals and the performances. It's, it's every now and then you see a film in which the music is so perfect, and you think that this must be some kind of divine intervention or something. The director and the composer and and the rest of the crew, including the editors and the sound edit- editors, were clearly all working off the same hymn sheet, and it, and it, it just coheres so magnificently well, and. Uh, th- this um, score came in the midst of an extraordinary purple patch for um, for James Horner. I mean, in the same year, he wrote Field of Dreams, which is one of my favourite Horner scores, and for which he was Oscar nominated, and yet he wasn't Oscar nominated for Glory. I believe he was Golden Globe nominated for Glory, presumably. Presumably that's because the Academy was scared about the usual thing of maybe the two James Horner scores cancelling each other out, perhaps. 
um that might have had something to do with it but regardless two masterpieces but we're obviously here to talk about glory so uh it's it's a symphonic score as one would expect from james horner it uses the boys choir of harlem so african-american boys choir which creates that sense of identification with the, the central characters at the at the heart of the movie so you have already you have a real sense of care and attention in terms of the the research and the harmonics of the music as uh, aligned to the depiction of the events in the movie that that's really really important and then you have the boys choir of harlem mixed with the, an adult voice choir which you get this very interesting mixture of the the, the, the lyrical innocence of the boys choir with the sound the kind of pragmatism brooding of the male choir which really explodes into life during the um the charging Fort Wagner sequence, which is the, the battle scene, yeah, which is one of the best battle scenes ever put on screen, largely because of James Horner's score that propels it along. And the the, the interesting thing is that, that, that it, as is usual with James Horner, one cannot talk about James Horner without addressing that kind of magpie-like tendency that he had for apparently cribbing um, not just his own works, but works of other people as well. There's a lot of people say, well, the Fort Wagner scene is the Carmina Burana, the Orf, the choral um, sort of fugue. Uh, I think it's a fugue. Uh, and it does sound very similar to that, but it's also James Horner putting his own spin on it, uh, which, which is interesting. Uh, but yeah, that, that, is, that is the inevitable conversation that always comes up in works about James Horner. When, if you get past that, what you will get is one of the best scores of the 1980s and one of the best scores of James Horner's career that is largely driven by the vocals. I think it's, it's one of the best choral-driven scores in the history of film music easily and the the variations in the voices are extraordinary I mean, it's interesting it's largely a score that's driven by one theme uh which is the again the, the boys choir of harlem it's almost like an elegy to the, to the lost lives of the 54th massachusetts infantry regiment the, the music is an elegy for them and the variations that horner puts that through in 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 various guises is, is is really really quite breathtaking and similar with with many other scores that we've talked about on on this episode today you have the fife and drum arrangements some of which are actual pieces of source music and that, that not done by james horner but he incorporates source music that's accurate to the time and interweaves that as well it's a really really astonishing score i mean i'm interested because you haven't seen the film and yet you have listened to the score what what did you think of it i i I, th- I thought it was great i thought it was definitely in line with you know you've contextualized it brilliantly as ever really but i thought it was in line with horner's music it felt like a james horner score you know it had those definitive similar you know uses of, of drums and you know I, I suppose it reminded me in places of what he would go on to do on braveheart in a way as well that same kind of when he's plucking from a historical period, you know, he's playing with similar instrumentation, even though Braveheart's a very different film and it is a different score. But just that context of Horner and and the kind of music he delivers, it was very much along similar lines, but it was really great. It really was, it really did sweep you along with the the setting and the story and really had a sense of place and time about it. I, I, yeah, I thought it was fab. I thought it was fab. So many of these films that I haven't seen, the scores really do make me want to go and investigate the movie and you know as ever a great score makes or makes or breaks a film um, you know and i think this is one that makes it yeah definitely i mean there there are there are very very famous scenes in which the score goes darker and you get the um the, the strings are almost calling out in anguish there's the very famous scene when denzel washington's character trip is being um flogged and you get this very there's a very famous scene where the camera pushes slowly in towards his face as he's trying he's basically conveying he's trying to contain his pain but he's conveying all the anguish and the and the rage through his eyes and James Horner's score works so brilliantly in that in that scene in particular there's this sense of like coiled anger but yeah you're right i mean the, the stylistic in, the stylistic instrumental choices that are very very signature Horner, like the use of the tubular bells during the charge sequence which again is yeah like you quite rightly said was used in braveheart and maybe apollo 13 and many many other scores as well legends of the fall it's it's a score that it adds a very very profound texture to the movie the movie would be brilliant without the score but the score almost turns it into something like a almost like a ghost story in a way if you listen to the score in its own terms it does have that very ghostly very ethereal quality to it the idea that this is a very very important chapter in the history of the american civil war and we are kind of being 
taken back through the mists of time to revisit it. You know, Horner, he liked to score movies that were about characters. He liked he liked to be able to paint with very, very bold, you know, often quite brash and melodramatic colours. And Horner got a lot of criticism for that. I think this is one of the examples where the sense of melodrama in the music is exactly right. The tone of it is exactly what the film needs. It doesn't tip the movie over the edge into parody, nor does the score hold back and sort of remain anonymous. It's just, I mean, one must credit the the mixing as well. Uh, the Sean, Sean Murphy is the, is the mixer, who's one of the best mixers in, in, in film music. He, I think, I believe he also worked on Jurassic Park. One must also credit the, you know, the technicians behind the scenes on a film score because they get overlooked. They always get overlooked, and I think they're very important as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. It, de- it all comes together, doesn't it? It all spirals together to make something really special. So, yeah, it's fantastic. We're going to spiral back for your final choice, Sean, to the Spaghetti Western going back into westerns but a very very different type of one here to Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West from 1968 which is of course scored by the one the only Ennio Morricone which this this was the film that came after his uh his Dollars trilogy I think didn't it it was just it was it came after that but before the uh the bizarre but quite good doc you sucker um, which, <laughs> which, which, I, which i think is, i i think's a lot of fun that and that, that um, score's also got a theme which has got my name in it sean the, the, the Neo Morricone music yeah it does sean sean, <laughs> yeah. sean sean i love that i love that theme uh, that's true actually yeah, i've never thought of that i'm just gonna think of you now during that which is a bit weird sorry about you that. Know the <laughs> yeah sorry um and then yeah obviously once upon a time in america comes much later before uh the only passes away in the 80s but this the, i mean this is a classic movie and I mean it's a, I mean Morricone doesn't really do know how to do bad scores really does he or you know, not not very often anyway and this is this is sumptuous I mean you could probably me- it's easier to measure the amount of bad Morricone scores than it's to measure the good ones because apparently he's written over 400 film scores and he's probably might possibly be the greatest melodist that 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 cinema has ever known he's got some competition there you think of like you know John Barry George Delery Jerry Goldsmith uh, James Horner, John Williams, and so on. But Ennio Morricone just takes my breath away just every single time. I don't know how. He's one of those people, I don't know how he does it. I, I genuinely don't know how someone can come up with music that is so beautiful. And one must, as we've said repeatedly throughout this particular episode and other episodes, one must also credit the director for giving the composer space and yet also communicating with them about the impetus of the story. And Leone, it was very famous with Leone. He would have Morricone compose the music first. And this is what happened on Once Upon a Time in the West. He would have Morricone compose the music first and they would play back the music on the set. So the actors could listen to it while they were acting the scene, which would further invest them in what they were doing. And Lord only knows what that must have been like for the likes of Henry Fonda and Charles Bronson and Claudia Cardinale as, as they were hearing this music for the first time while they were making the movie. That must have just been an astonishingly profound experience because it is, but even by the standards of Morricone's career, it's a career topping achievement. It, it, it's remarkable to think that Morricone has seemingly got a bottomless well of inspiration. You think that <laughs> <laughs> he's come off he's literally come off the dollars trilogy which themselves that they they rewrote the rule book on the western scores with the use of the, the jaw harp and, and the male vocals and the mariachi trumpets those scores were revolutionary in and of themselves but to then further revise it with once upon a time in the west which i think strikes more of an elegiac lyrical even strained note than the earlier dollars movies and in particular the use of jill's theme the, for the claudia cardinal character claudia cardinale uh apologies if i'm mispronouncing that that that, that classic scene when she arrives in the train station and the camera cranes up and you've got the uh, the use of the vocalist the um edda deloso um who worked regularly with morricone uh some of the best choral usage of any film score i know i said earlier about about um glory this is right up there with it and the the soprano vocal is just astonishingly beautiful and I went back and revisited this score in its entirety in preparation for this episode. It was the first time I'd actually listened to this score all the way through in isolation for quite a while. And the variation on Jill's theme in the finale track at the end must be one of the most, not just the most beautiful piece of film music, but one of the most beautiful piece of film music ever. 
you know in in the history of of you know mankind probably if that's not to overstate it too much and intermixed with that you have the uh, the man with the harmonica theme which accompanies the, the, the you first hear it in the film in that classic scene when henry fonda turns up you think oh blimey henry fonda is playing the psychotic killer and it's just one of the most brilliant pieces of counter casting in any film because you've got the blue-eyed henry fonda playing a sadistic maniac and the 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 stylistics of that track very much emphasise kind of electric guitar and and jaw harp, and they've got a much more kind of brutal mechanistic air to them. And then obviously you've got the harmonica thrown into the mix, which, as you realise, the the, the 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 fates of the Henry Fonda and the Charles Bronson characters are connected up, and the the, the harmonic, the use of the harmonica on the Ennio Morricone score connects these two characters up almost before you know that, that that that's that's a component in the narrative is very very clever very very well done and the way that Morricone flip flops between these moments of lyricism and these kind of the brutal experimental tones is really well wrought it doesn't feel like a score that that's messy everything has got there's a very very clear narrative going through it and given that Leone was an operatic director. The music does play out like like an opera. It plays out in a very very heightened manner. It's a really astonishing score, and even by the standards of Morricone's works, I mean, you think of other things, think of like Days of Heaven or or The Mission, or it's it's up there. I mean, that it hardly needs me to say that it's it's, it's one of the most well regarded scores and one of the most well regarded films of all time. And and it, and it fits within our scope because it is set obviously in the old west, and it's even though it's got a, it, you know, a different approach to a lot of these movies in what it's trying to do. It's just it's nice to throw in something that just approaches this from a slightly different context, and I think it, it's always so like like we say, like we said a couple of times in this podcast, it's really interesting when these. Uh, non-American filmmakers tackle American history, and it's it was something that Leone so was obviously very interested in, um, because then you know twenty years later he, he goes back to America for his last film. But it's it is interesting how these composers and these directors who aren't from America f- find a way to explore this nation musically in such incredible terms. Yeah, well, they they clearly he and Leone and Morricone were but they were they were school friends. They knew each other, and they were clearly simpatico with each other. And they obviously saw that the birth of Monde America as an opera. It's an operatic um, symphony of, of of happiness and tragedy, of hope and despair, and the the use of the the use of the visual language as with the dollar dollars trilogy you go from extreme close-ups to these extraordinary widescreen vistas and the music follows suit the music goes from the music goes from these kind of soaring melodies to these relatively more intimate moments i mean the other thing is the other theme i haven't mentioned is the clip clop theme for um for jason robard's character which again strikes more of a honky-tonk kind of comical note but but it works. It, it feels authentic to the kind of saloon music that one might have expected at the time. So it's a very well researched score as well as as one would expect from Morricone. But yeah, it's 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 a score about the found the foundations of modern America, which again, like you quite rightly said, Once Upon a Time in America kind of builds on that idea because in Once Upon a Time in America, it's kind of early twentieth century. We've moved on from Once Upon a Time in the West, but those principles are still there. It's like how is America evolving? as a country and how do you hear that through the music in conjunction with the visuals yeah it's just just fa- fabulous fabulous creation it's wonderful absolutely wonderful but we're going to finish with my last choice which is a film that i wouldn't say is wonderful i'd say it's decent <laughs> it's pretty good really i i do i do it did enjoy this actually i didn't watch this too long ago actually and i did quite like it it was quite fun um but it's another roland emmerich film as you mentioned earlier and this is The Patriot from the year 2000, starring Mel Gibson as uh, Benjamin Martin, who is uh, like a composite figure of uh, people from the American Revolutionary War, who is uh, drawn into a battle against the British crown, uh, sort of at the foundation of you know the revolution, um, and uh, it, it epitomised by Jason Isaac's brilliantly malevolent turn as, a, as Tavington, Colonel Tavington. And uh, it's it's a silly, overblown, very patriotic American epic that sort of sort of sums up really the the topic in a way. It's purely looking from the outside. It's very daft. It's a very daft 
way of approaching, if entertaining, this whole historical subject matter. Very, very historically loose with facts. Um, you know, quite a bit of controversy at certain points about certain things, particularly in atrocity involving a church, which was just bonkers, really. Um, but it's got a John Williams score. Now, I was shocked when I put this on, this film. I was like, no way, John Williams. One of the few films that he's not he's not scoring for people like Steven Spielberg or George Lucas, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I was really surprised. It's, uh, but, and even though it's not amongst John Williams' greatest hits... I think he really does do some terrific work here. Yeah, of course he is, because it's John Williams. And regardless of the quality of the film, John Williams never, ever puts a foot wrong. And yeah, I mean, we, we, we've we referred to the lack of subtlety in Wolfgang Peterson's films a few times on this podcast. <laughs> I mean, Roland Emmerich's work on The Patriot makes Wolfgang Peterson look like Stanley Kubrick, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, yeah, I mean, it's fair. The Patriot is ridiculous. It's it's utterly it is. It's, 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 it's utter nonsense, and it's basically Mel Gibson going Mad Max on the English again, but just in <laughs> <laughs> just in in, yeah. in the English in the Revolutionary War as opposed to you know as opposed to the Scots versus the English in, in Braveheart. So it's it's Mad Mel going like full bloodlust. Um, mad man. yeah mad man, yeah <laughs> it's not it, it doesn't have any concessions to history or to believability no. or seemingly to anything on planet earth um but it's <laughs> <laughs> It's you know the, the movie has kind of got a vigour. To I'm it. getting the sense you didn't like this one, Sean. You know what? And despite <laughs> what I've just said, I actually do kind of like the film. I like the film for its vigour and, yeah. and for its battle scenes and for the fact that you know just as a piece of hammy, rip roaring Hollywood melodrama that's shamelessly manipulative, it kind of does the job. You know, yeah. the heroes are really heroic. The villains, as you said, play represented by Jason Isaacs, are fiendishly, annoyingly, horribly over the top. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't wait in this film for Jason Isaacs to get his comeuppance at the end, which he ultimately no, does. You can't. Um, and I think that it, it's it's a problematic spectacle. You mentioned the church burning scene there, yeah. Which apparently, looking that up, apparently screenwriter Robert Rodat drew uh, took uh, something that had happened in World War Two, a real life incident where the Nazis burned the church full of people to the ground, and he applied that to the to the Revolutionary War, which is just nonsense because apparently that didn't happen in in the Revolutionary War. There aren't mm. any records of it. No, but the the score, the, so this is one of those things where you, okay, so in the context of the movie, the score kind of kind of amplifies the, the silliness of it because it, it, it's a movie, the, the score makes the movie feel more overblown than it is, but you can't criticise John Williams for that because he's doing, he's following his brief. That's clearly what he's there to do. The, the, the directive of the movie is to play up the valour of, the militia and the rebels and it's to emphasize the relative evil of the english people that's what the film does you know for better or worse and therefore the score kind of has to follow suit so therefore what you get in the opening patriot suite classic john williams what he does is he begins and ends the album with um a concert suite of the main themes there are two themes in in the in the score as i can make out two main themes which is one is the lyrical um family theme for benjamin martin himself which is carried on the fiddles which is beautiful it's got a real um, bucolic pastoral air to it and then that then surges into the militaristic theme for the fives and the drums we've mentioned those instruments a lot on this episode um, which carries the spirit of the colonial cause. That, as far as I was aware, listening to the score, that is the theme that appears most throughout the the um, score, that, that militaristic militia theme. And it's put through, as you would expect from John Williams, put through an extraordinary amount of revelations, some heroic, some kind of despondent. And, um, but it's uh, what, what struck me about listening to the score on its own is there's there's not actually that much action music in it, really, is it? It's more. There are bits. No, there are bits of it, but not that much. Not really. No, it's 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 strange. It's a strange mix in the. But then there's not a vast amount of action in the film, really. It there's the cert the certain battle scenes, but there's not a lot of it. Is just particular conversations. The English being villainous, boo hiss. You know, Mel being heroic. And then you get you get the odd bursts of action. So, but I, th- I think it's it's one of those scores where Williams plays. He definitely plays the emotion. He plays the rousing, you know, heroics of it. He plays the 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 theme, uh, and I don't mean theme literally. I mean the thematic idea of of America of this founding, you know, heroic moment, quote unquote, in American history. 
I think that's what he angles it onto as opposed to making it big and bombastic in the way that maybe other composers would have done. Yeah, and I think that what what the score also demonstrates is that Williams is very, very good at finding moments of um, kind of sorrowful despair in certain um, action sequences. There's a scene quite early on where Mel Gibson's son has been shot and then he goes and he goes and rescues his older son played by Heath Ledger from from the troops and then he ends up basically tomahawking <laughs> this guy to, to bits <laughs> um, yeah. and Williams's score in that scene is very very good because it's not it's not it's not playing up the you know the nobility of the Williams character what it's doing is it's lamenting the savagery and the hideousness of the situation that Mel Gibson's character is a violent character he's tried to put that behind him that violence has now resurged to the surface again because his son has been killed and he's now having to take revenge on the English and Williams is very very good at that at playing that through the strings at playing the despair and the horror of the situation that's what he also did that and you think of um for example Born on the 4th of July or Saving Private Ryan he's he's brilliant at doing that and I think even in a piece of like complete corn like this film is um <laughs> he's he can find the dignity in it john williams can find dignity and resonance in material and that is why he is it, one of the many reasons why he's revered as revered as he is and it's interesting that he was oscar nominated for this score he didn't win um and as i mentioned earlier this was originally going to be scored by david arnold who reportedly wrote a few demos Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin then looked at those demos and went nah we don't want that and John Williams so happens to have a gap in his schedule they got John Williams in I don't know what the circumstances are I mean clearly Arnold has not worked with Emmerich or Devlin again so clearly I don't know how acrimonious that split was but yeah it's an interest it's an interesting thing but yeah their only collaboration with with John Williams they haven't worked with John Williams since interesting yeah, it's it's yeah. I mean, to be fair, probably good for John Williams given the state of the films they've released really yeah. since this. Uh, you know, there's not, there's not been that many good ones from Emmerich and Devlin really. But um, but yeah, I I think it. I really I do like this score. I think it's re- it's not amongst John Williams' best, but it's it is really good and it encapsulates a sillier take on American history, a much sillier take on American history. And it's it's a be- it's definitely a better score than the movie, I think. Definitely, that's it. Really, we've reached the ten, and I I think we've it's been lovely going back and listening to all this stuff, or listening to some of it for the first time, actually, um, or not for a long time. Not uh, you know, not listening to this because there's I haven't seen the films in a long time, or I haven't seen the films at all. It's just been great. It's been really, it's been really nice to sort of think about the American historical experience through this music. And I think there's some gems for people to go away and listen to if they haven't already. Yeah, and it, it shows what a multifaceted area the birth of America is, as filtered through film music and and cinema. There are, you know, there are many many ways to skin a cat, and um, you know the. The, the birth of America is is a storied and bloody and gory and inspiring one, and clearly that's what's fired up each of the composers that we've that we've showcased today. You know that the, these the the music the music that we've played today captures feelings of you know mythology and landscape and individual characters and sadness and happiness. Yeah, I, I've I've really enjoyed it. I, I think I think it was it was a good selection today, really good selection. Yeah, it's been great. It's been really good. And uh, we're going to be back soon for another blast of music. We, we're we sort of on the bubble of not knowing when new films are coming out. Everything, you know, we're recording this at the very end of June. So everything keeps being pushed back or is very uncertain right now. So it's meaning we're having to jiggle around a little bit of our recording schedules and things. But uh, we're going to come back in a, in a couple of weeks for something a bit different, something a bit more upbeat, I would suggest. Um, in a way and uh, more contemporary so that'll be fun definitely looking forward to that yeah nice one well it's been good Sean it's been great to talk to you again um, and and do another one of these thanks everyone for joining us for another episode Uh, remember we're part of the We Made This Podcast Network uh, because the music of American independence and history is not all we're discussing on that network right now and we'll give you a little taste of what else you might have missed in a minute but until then we hope you enjoy listening to the film music we've discussed as ever, stay stay well, stay safe, wherever you are uh, and whatever your situation is. Uh, and until we see you next time, thanks for listening to us talk about film music between the notes. Elsewhere on We Made This. 
Pick a disc. If I think about what I've got in my collection, yeah, I've got quite a few Rating Steeds albums, and yeah, you, you, you can't beat a lot of them, really. It saves a lot of time coming through, uh, you know, people's back catalogs and albums and things. You can discover more. It's a kind of a bit of a taster, really. There's only sort of certain artists that I definitely know that I like that I have got lots and lots of their albums. The Movie Palace. So tell us about, um, I mean, last time we spoke, uh, people who listened to the Casablanca episode will remember, we spoke about the film club you do at the library you work at. So how has Hitchcock kind of factored into that? Which of his films have you screened uh, at the library? We've actually screened in four years, we've screened three Hitchcock films. We we did, I think the first one we did was Shadow of a Doubt. Mm -hmm. And then we did Rear Window about midway last year. And maybe back in April, we did Notorious. So we've only done three in four years. Um, we get a lot of requests from yeah. the audiences to do more Hitchcock. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast. It took me to a bought the DVDs like six months later to watch, it, watch that episode. So, you know, and then this was 1988. Yeah. So... So yeah, it, it, I think it, that makes a big difference. The Lost, the time when you were watching Lost was almost like a transitional period between what was going on in Red Dwarf time to what we have now, where everybody gets everything immediately, and even if and they get it and they binge it. There was a lot of binge culture then, but it was with just the DVDs. There really still wasn't a way other than perhaps videoing stuff off the telly. But yeah. That was more difficult than getting the whole thing in your hand. I can watch this from start to finish, you know? Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This Podcast Network. Between the Notes is produced and edited by Tony Black, who hosts alongside Sean Wilson. You can find Tony on Twitter at AJBlackWriter and Sean on Twitter at SeanO22. You can find Between the Notes on Twitter at btw underscore notes on itunes your podcast app of choice on spotify stitcher and on spreaker where the show is part of the we made this podcast network for more podcasts all about tv film books music and popular culture in general you can find we made this on facebook and on twitter at we made this pod thanks for listening (laughs) 